I'm very pleased to introduce our distinguished guest who has the wonderful experience of looking at his own picture on the screen while I talk about him. <laughs> Matthew Christman is Associate Research Scholar and Director of the Life Worth Living Project, uh, Program at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. He is also a lecturer of Divinity and Humanities at Yale University. He completed his PhD in Religious Studies at Yale in 2014, focusing on New Testament scholarship. While a doctoral student, he and his wife Hannah planted and pastored the Elm City Vineyard Church, which is a dynamic, diverse urban church in New Haven, Connecticut. He has a deep grounding in both the church and the academy. And with that, he brings to all of his work a passion for the intersection of the life of faith and the life of the mind. His main research interests lie in the Epistles of St. Paul, illuminated by various streams of contemporary philosophy of science, theologi uh, theological reflection, and critical theory. And his first book is called The Emergence of Sin, published in uh, 2017 by Oxford University Press. And uh, he has a couple of new books since then. I'm going to let him share that. But first, I want to tell you about his Yale connections. Um, in addition to his PhD, Matt got his BA from Yale College in 2001 and uh, MAR from Yale Divinity School in 06. After his divinity degree, he spent the summer in Ghana studying with uh, the great African theologian, I'm going to say the last name wrong, Matt, Kwame Bedeyako. Bediako, yeah. Bediako, very close. All right. <laughs> As an advocate of interfaith dialogue, Matt has facilitated sacred text readings of the New Testament and the Quran in partnership with local churches and mosques. And he also serves as a faculty advisor for the Yale Humanist Community and the Life Worth Living Fellows. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for joining us today. Tell us about your most recent two books. Uh, I, I, I promise um, she put me up to this. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, so, uh, so, so one uh, in 2019, I uh, uh, wrote with uh, Miroslav Wolf uh, this book uh, for the life of the world, uh, theology that makes a difference. Um, perhaps relevant to our to our trip there, the the last chapter, sort of a vision of we propose that what uh, what makes theology valuable and why we should do theology um, is because theology is one of the sort of key disciplines through which we can ask big questions about meaning and purpose and the sort of shape of flourishing life. And so at the end of that book, we actually um, spent a chapter talking about a Christian vision of flourishing life. Um, and the one that we take up is that of St. Paul. Um, and so you imagine that will be uh, one of the uh, topics of one of our lectures, um, to sort of think about the texts uh, of Paul together. Another one just from like three days ago, hot off the press, um, off the is, press. is this one, uh, The Hunger for Home, again with, with Miroslav Wolf. And um, uh, here we're, we're taking up this sort of theme of, of food and meals in the Gospel of Luke. Um, but again, always within the broader context of sort of asking, um, what is a good life? Um, what is a, a flourishing life? Um, how, do, how do meals um, sort of locate us in particular places and with particular communities? And think about um, home as a, a sort of central picture of what it might, make, what it might be to, uh, to flourish together. Well, that's wonderful. And thank you for sharing about your books. And I feel like um, we should have you back. One of the things that we like to do here at Yale Alumni Academy is uh, feature new books that come out from our Yale scholars like you. So I would love to have you back to do a virtual uh, book signing, perhaps in the fall. And you can tell us about how you liked Turkey. Um, so I'm going to move us forward to just talk about um, what we're going to talk about this afternoon is our tour to Turkey. And I want to root that conversation just in a, in a bit of history of Turkey. And I know, Matt, you've got um, some, some orienting that you can do for us as well. Um, but I think it's really important to understand traveling in Turkey to, just to get a sense of who's been there throughout the ages. Uh, so um, the history of Turkey goes back, obviously, to, you know, Bronze Age and Iron Age settlements, um, but we think of its sort of recent uh, 
ancient history as um, beginning in this as the seat of the Hittite empire. It then gets, and I'm just going really quickly through some of the eras, it gets colonized by the Greeks who established the city of Byzantium. It gets conquered by the Persian empire and subsequently um, Alexander the Great comes in behind the Persian empire and, and takes hold and defeats the Persians. And at that time it enters its Hellenistic and Roman age, uh, becomes a part of the Roman empire. And we think of it, very frequently, we think of the name Constantinople, those of us who were sort of old enough to remember. And it gets that name from the Emperor Constantine the Great in 330 AD. Uh, and then enters the golden age of the Byzantine Empire under the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century uh, BCE or AD. Um, and the Byzantine Empire then falls to the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century. The Ottoman Empire endures until the close of World War I. Now, why is this important? Um, and before I go to the sort of next era of Turkey's history, is because if you think about this, um, you know, going back to the Roman era, there's always been a very strong religious identity as part of the national identity of Turkey. Um, you know, whether it's during the Hellenistic age or the Roman era, or whether it's during um, the Byzantine era and its Christian history, followed by the Ottoman Empire and its Muslim history. And what happens uh, after World War I is uh, the Turkish War of Independence. And we, we see Ataturk come to power and in 1923 founds the Republic of Turkey, which becomes a, makes Turkey a secular country. Um, and Ataturk makes a lot of changes in the way that the country is run and organized. Um, and, and that legacy sort of endures to this day. Um, and we have under the current president of Turkey, President Erdogan, uh, a sense of a sensibility of, and this is the only little bit that I'm really going to um, touch on this until I speak about Hagia Sophia, but a sensibility of um, sort of reviving Turkey's religious connections to its Muslim past. Um, we sort of all know, if we watch the nightly news, Turkey is a member of, of NATO, entered NATO in 1952, um, but has sort of teetered on the unknown future of whether or not it becomes part of the EU uh, in, its, in its recent history. So it's just, I think, important to have your grounding in Turkey with just an understanding of um, the contested groups that have come through and taken hold of power and history that exists um, in the country. So if we look at our tour itinerary, it's really a coastal cruise on uh, the more than 630 miles um, from the Aegean Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. We're uh, following archeological points of interest. Uh, two of those are among the seven wonders of the ancient world um, that we're passing through. It, of course, the Riviera of Turkey, as some call it, is known for its beautiful beaches, its towns, its uh, fishing villages. But really a big focus of our um, journey is its archeological treasures and its religious history and the connection to St. Paul. And with that, I will stop and toss to you, Matt, if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, your interest in the region and, and perhaps give us a, a sense of a biblical orientation to, uh, to this area. Yeah, so this, um, as biblical scholars, we think of this as Asia Minor, um, and from the sort of, uh, sort of, uh, certainly in the Roman period, a sort of, um, as much of the sort of you think about the Greek East of the of the Roman Empire, it's this sort of place of mixing of, um, uh, of lots of different sort of cultural influences. Um, for for Paul. Um, think of um, Galatians quite often as one of his first uh, first letters in Galatia is somewhere north in uh, in Asia Minor uh, inland. Um, this is a really important um, region for Paul's uh, for Paul's ministry and really important to that is some of the um, is, is, is the sort of vibrant um, and really diverse sort of religious life um, in ancient Asia Minor. We have the mystery cults. We have the sort of ancient uh, temples and the ancient sort of practices of the 
are sort of known to known maybe known to us as sort of the the classical Greek and uh, Roman gods and and, and goddesses. Um, we have these the this sort of uh, so we sort of imagine like a, a pretty vibrant sort of religious marketplace into which um, Paul is walking as he's doing um, his um, his uh, missionary work as he's doing his work sort of sharing about um, uh, the the Messiah the anointed one of the king of of Israel um, the anointed king of Israel um, that would have been a sort of Palestine would have been a pretty um, exotic uh, eastern, even further eastern sort of uh, backwater. But here is here's Paul coming in um, and saying that something that's going on out there, something that's come from out there, um, is somehow sort of key to all of what's happening in civilization and sort of what God is doing and sort of remaking the world. Um, that would have probably struck folks in this area as. Um, a little bit odd, um, maybe a little bit intriguing, um, probably more than a little bit sort of exotic. Um, there's a sort of uh, ancient Orientalism, sort of thought that like things that come from the East, um, sort of some sort of recollection that um, there are deeper and older histories in the East and in Egypt, um, sort of thought that um, and there's an ancient impulse that um, if we have an instinct to think that that which is newer is always better, if anything, in the ancient world, we have the opposite impulse that um, if you want to know what's true, what is right, what is good, um, you want to find your most ancient, uh, ancient sources, um, and there is reflection um, happening in, uh, in the Roman world, so reflecting on um, sort of the, the mixing that's going on. Is Solon, the lawgiver of Athens, um, was he first? Was he before Moses, um, uh, who, who gave laws uh, further in the East? Uh, how do they sort of compare on the timelines to various sorts of heroes um, of ancient Egypt? Um, all of these are sort of are, are in the background as, as Paul um, sort of comes uh, comes into these communities, comes into these cities, and is trying to draw together uh, communities of folks who might want to hear about um, this gospel of uh of of the christ um the anointed one um even that for what it's worth we, seems to have caused confusion um in the greek speaking world <laughs> you say the christ uh uh um it just sounds like the oily one the greasy one um uh hebrew people uh, anointed their kings um and and many others in the ancient world did not so they did not understand but um they did use oil to to bathe um so uh this uh, sort of going around preaching about this Jesus Christ. Um, this was a little bit confusing uh, to folks. Um, but anyway, but but the sort of general thought that there might be um, something, some sort of important insight uh, into the world and the way it is um, that might be coming sort of um, from even further east, um, sort of meeting in, uh, coming into this uh, sort of particularly vibrant um, world of of commerce and of intellectual life and certainly of sort of uh, uh, deep and diverse sort of religious practice with the sort of ancient temple cults and the more sort of um, hip and new sort of mystery cults that were popular among the Roman soldiers. Um, all of that is sort of going on in this um, in this area and I'm excited that as we get to as we travel we'll get an opportunity to see um, literally how it's like side by side um, a lot of these different practices were and the sort of um, yeah, re vibrant religious marketplace in which Paul was doing his work. I love the way you phrase that the vibrant religious marketplace because I think that really does capture um, it, it captures so much about what's magical about Turkey what's fascinating about its history. Uh, we start the tour in Istanbul and I just wanted to hang on the map just for a moment to point out something that I'm sure everyone is aware of, but visually it's, it's still really valuable to look at it and see that, um, that Turkey is this country that, that spans two continents. So Europe and Asia, and you have in Istanbul a city that literally sits right on the border between the two continents with the Bosphorus uh, dividing the different the the European side of the city from the Asian side of the city, uh, and that gives all kinds of color and texture to uh, the culture of Istanbul, to its history, to its 
position as a um, strategic, economic, and military influence in the region, really just going back into antiquity. We think about it now in our contemporary times, but it, I think as, the more you understand the history, the more you realize that it's pretty much always been this really critical geographic location um, going back even into the ancient world. So uh, there's, there's a lot to say about Istanbul and we certainly can't say it all. We could do a whole webinar just on Istanbul, um, but I want to highlight just some things about uh, what you think of, what you want to think of on a visit to Istanbul. Um, certainly, I'm going to point out throughout the trip just our accommodations and information about the trip, but this presentation is as much for you to learn about this specific trip as it is for you to learn about, um, about visiting these places, whether you travel with us or not. Uh, so one thing that struck me when I went to Istanbul uh, for the first time was just how massive it was. And having lived for many years in New York City, you think of it in America, we think of New York City as one of the world's great cities. It's a city of about 8 million people. Istanbul is a city of about 15 million people. So uh, nearly double the size of New York City. And during the tourist season, that can expand to about 20 million people. So it's truly a bustling metropolis um, and a crossroads of the world. Uh, there are many places that you want to see in Istanbul. I can warn you right off the bat that lots of people are going to try to sell you Turkish carpets. And you just need to prepare your strategy for that before you go. Um, but I want to focus on uh, the sites that we are going to see on our stop in Istanbul. Um, the Hagia Sophia being uh, the first major site that we see it. And you see it here pictured. So you see two things um, pictured. You see the blue mosque in the foreground and in the background, you see the Hagia Sophia. And um, why am I showing it to you like this? Because it's there, these two mosques, uh, these two sites have a real important connection to each other um, throughout their history. The Hagia Sophia was the largest Eastern Roman church in Istanbul. It's been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1985. Um, its name literally means holy wisdom or divine wisdom. It was uh, dedicated in 360 by Emperor Constantius and rebuilt by Emperor Theodosius II um, and built again between 532 and 537 by uh, Emperor Justinian I. So, and, and by that time, the city was known as uh, Constantinople and the uh, Hagia Sophia was the largest Christian cathedral in the world. Um, it's also now the largest, uh, the oldest, the world's oldest and fastest completed cathedral. And it's, it's been expanded, built and rebuilt over time, just as I sort of described. Uh, notably, something we don't think about looking at it today is the dome has collapsed several times uh, on the cathedral because it was so grand and great that they had to kind of refine the um, methods of construction. And it has a real significance as uh, the culture and social political um, center of Turkey's identity. It becomes a part of the narrative of Turkish identity in each successive era. So if you think about all those different groups, you know, coming from the Byzantine era going forward, uh, a major turning point in its history, of course, was in 1453, following the fall of Constantinople um, to the Ottoman Emperor, Empire. And you can see these changes um, in when you go into uh, the Hagia Sophia, you see these changes in the iconography. And we're going to talk about that in the architecture. Most notably, it's got four minarets. So you can see those. I don't know if I can, I probably can't get my. Let's see, there we go. I got my spotlight so I can point to you. You've got four minarets there, and those were added. Um, those were added when it was converted to a mosque. They obviously make it feel a lot and look a lot more like a mosque, but they also provided structural reinforcement, um, which some credit with no more collapsing of the domes uh, after the minarets were, were added. Um, it, two of them were added by a famous Turkish architect called Sinan. 
And the other two were added sort of later by subsequent architects. So also interesting that they weren't all four added and built at the same time. Um, when Ataturk took power, he uh, declared the Hagia Sophia a museum. So it became a museum in 1935, no longer a religious building, now a secular building, standing as a testament to that uh, Byzantine history and the Ottoman history. And made it was made open to visits of all nations and all religions. Um, and very, very recently, this has changed. So we talked about you know, this being a sort of the site of Turkish national identity. And as we see Turkey become a more um, conservative uh, Muslim country under the current presidential um, regime, we see a decision just in July of 2020 by the Tur by a Turkish high court reclaiming the status of the Hagia Sophia as an active mosque. So it is now used uh, for regular worship by Muslims. And that I think is just a fascinating sort of turn of events because throughout the history, um, one of the things that draws people to the Hagia Sophia is the iconography and design that you see on the inside. So there are 104 marble columns, some of them brought from ancient cities throughout the region. Um, and we have this iconography that uh, is reflected in the mosaics and the Christian mosaics. Many of them were actually destroyed, uh, not by the original mosaics, destroyed not by Muslims, but by um, Christians during the Byzantine iconoclast period in the eighth and ninth centuries. And then that period came to an end and the mosaics were reinstalled. Um, so the ones you see here pictured are dating from later in the ninth century. And then you have the moment where Mehmet the Conqueror comes in, uh, Sultan, and converts the Hagia Sophia to a mosque and made a very critical decision to preserve some of these Christian mosaics. And that's how they've managed to survive and you can still see them. Um, on the left here, you see uh, an image of Christ um, flanked by the Empress Zoe on the right and um, Emperor Constantine the Ninth on the left. And I wanted to show you one more image because this is really significant. Um, here you can see the Virgin Mary and the Christ child between Justinian the first on the left, who's holding a model of the Hagia Sophia, and Constantine, Emperor Constantine on the right, holding a model of the city of Constantinople. Um, and this is one of the ninth century mosaics. Uh, in mosque architecture, you never see human images depicted. Um, and Yet these depictions of Mary and Jesus remain uncovered, even when it became a mosque until 1739. And then at that time, um, this mosaic along with many others were plastered over. So they were covered in plaster um, for quite a long time until Ataturk came in and converted this to a museum. So I just wanna stop and see Matt, if you wanted to say anything, I know you have this really interesting um, uh, interfaith background um, about this history of the Hagia Sophia and the connection between the Muslim icon, uh, Muslim imagery and Christian imagery. Yeah, well, so I should say my, you know, my expertise is as a, Bi is as a Bible scholar. So um, I'm out over my skis um, in anything that has to do with religious art. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that, um, I mean, what, what's one thing that strikes me is in, in conversation, in contemporary interfaith dialogue, actually, um, conversation about Jesus ends up being a sort of perhaps surprising to some sort of surprisingly fruitful sort of place of 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 connection between contemporary Christian and Muslim communities um, because uh, of course Jesus is a is a uh, highly um, uh, highly honored prophet um, in Islam um, and so um, there are of course important disagreements about uh you know the, the divinity of christ or, or these sorts of like important theological disagreements um but actually you know a, a sort of uh, a recognition of, of of jesus even a recognition of mary um this is this is all quite uh recognizable um within uh contemporary uh muslim thought uh yeah so even yeah just sort of thinking about that from the sort of contemporary interfaith dialogue uh, point of view, the site is really interesting that way. And I should I should say one one other one other thought. Here in New Haven, we actually have a really 
fascinating um, Syrian um, artist, uh, Mohammed Hafez, um, who's an architect and, a, and, and, and an artist, um, his work many, many may know. Um, uh, but but any, he he has he's dedicated some of his recent religious uh, some of his recent uh, artwork to sort of celebrating the life of of Damascus um, in Syria actually and um, but one of the th key things that he's always trying to highlight is um, is the ways that um, churches and mosques sort of lived um, happily side by side one another um, in the in the Damascus context at the very least and this was sort of not problematic um, in various ways in part because of some of these theological overlaps and certainly because of the uh, some of the broad um, ethical sort of agreement between between these communities in terms of commitments to to, to love God and love neighbor um, I'll, I'll stop there well I think that no I think that's really wonderful and interesting to have that context to help you understand you know when you're inside the Hagia Sophia how you're you're in a space that's both been contested uh, by different religious groups, by different political leaders, and also simultaneously welcomed different groups, right? And you know, most recently in its um, in its history as a museum, and I would say you know now that it's been converted back to a mosque, um, there still is a sense of coexistence of Christian Muslim faiths in the sense that. What they've done is when the Muslims are wor worshiping there, they are veiling those mosaics that we just looked at. So they're veiled during times of Muslim worship and unveiled um, for viewings by, by visitors who are welcome for, from all different faiths. So really interesting um, when, you, when you go to visit to try to wrap your mind around that history. So I go back to this photo that shows, you know, just so, sort of how close the Blue Mosque is to the Hagia Sophia, because it will help us understand uh, the Blue Mosque and its history. Um, you see it in the, for in the foreground here. It was built by Sultan Ahmed in the 17th century. And we might say as, as Americans, well, why would you build one mosque right next to, the, to um, a mosque that was already there? Um, the Sultan's idea was that he was going to build a monument that would not only rival the Hagia Sophia, but also surpass it. Um, and some think that this was partially to distract from the fact that he wasn't so successful in warfare. Uh, but nevertheless, he commissioned the Blue Mosque, um, which is also known as the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, and put it right opposite the Hagia Sophia, right next to the Hippodrome. And it becomes a site of significant meaning because it dominates uh, the skyline from the south. It was built right on top of the foundations of the palaces of the Byzant Byzantine emperors. So it rests on their foundations and the vaults of the old grand palace. And uh, it helps us to understand when we see these two side by side, the connections between the Byzantine elements and the architecture of the Hagia Sophia um, as well as in the Blue Mosque, but simultaneously um, the Blue Mosque really being rooted in traditions of Islamic architecture. It gets its name as Blue Mosque from the tiles, from the colors blue being so frequently represented in the tiles on the inside. Uh, it it's features this sort of dome design, so one main dome, eight secondary domes. Uh, it's said that this benefits from 200 years of Ottoman mosque development. Uh, and now it's considered the last great classical period mosque in, in Turkey. Um, it's one of only two that have a real huge footprint and that footprint is marked by six minarets. So remember the Hagia Sophia had four when the Sultan built the Blue Mosque, um, he said he wanted six. And some people felt that that was a little offensive because it, it makes the mosque rival the prophets in, in Mecca. So the story goes that the Sultan paid for a seventh to be installed in Mecca so that he would be stepping in back into this place. Um, the interior of the mosque is decorated with over 20,000 of these handmade ceramic tiles, which are really an iconic um, feature when you're traveling around Turkey, you would see, you know, this. Uh, tradition of tile making and ceramics is a huge part of the Turkish history. You will see the represented, um, representative styles of flowers and tulips and cypresses fruit. Um, there are also more than 200 stained glass windows in the mosque. 
And uh, there are decorations, including verses from the Quran. Um, and the floors are covered with carpet. So when you go into the mosque, you will see people um, enjoying their time of worship as well. And the carpets have been donated by the faithful. So they really, it's a living building in that sense. Uh, I want to move forward to our next stop in Istanbul, which is the Hippodrome, built by uh, built in 2000 or 203 in the Common Era by Emperor Septimius Severus, and he conquered the city. Uh, and then in 330, uh, it was expanded when Constantine the first renamed the city Constantinople, uh, made it the capital of the Byzantine Emperor Empire, and he enlarged the Hippodrome. Um, and put it in the place where it is now, just sort of right uh, next to the, the section of town that we saw. Let's see if I can go back to it really. But it's just important to note that these places are all sort of right in the same vicinity. So when we get to the hip drum, uh, it functions throughout uh, the Roman period and the uh, Byzantine period, the Ottoman period as a public arena. And you can kind of see that in the image on the left. One of its main purposes was to host chariot races. Um, in fact, the Greek word hippodrome comes from the word for horse and the word for way. So it literally means horse, the way of the horses, essentially. Um, it was also a site for games by gladiators, for official ceremonies, celebrations, protests, etc. It's always essentially been a public arena. Uh, now it's known as Sultan Ahmed Square and it follows the ground plan and dimensions of the original Hippodrome, but you can see that much of what was there of the, of the earlier structure does not remain. Uh, many of the treasures, the statues and things like that have made their way through looters um, and trade in antiquities to museums around the world. But one that remains that's very notable is this obelisk that we see in the center, obelisk of Theodosius I, who brought this in from Egypt in 390 in the Common Era uh, and then named it for himself. But the obelisk is actually 3,500 years old. It's carved out of paint granite. And it was originally, um, if you've been on one of our other trips to Egypt with Alumni Academy, travels, you would have been maybe to the Temple of Karnak in Luxor, and that's where this obelisk comes from. Um, it was there during the reign of Tutmos III in about 1490 BC, so that it stands in such good condition to this very day um, after being moved is quite remarkable, and that's what we see here in the town square. And then the last place that we will pay in our very quick one-day visit in Istanbul on this um, on this tour is to the palace. Uh, and you know, I've spoken to some of you on the phone about this trip, and people have asked me, you know, how much time should I spend in Istanbul? And if I only have a day, what should I see? Well, these are the things you should see if you only have a day. But um, if you remember me saying it's a city of 15 million people, you could easily spend a month in Istanbul and still not really have a sense of the flavor of it. Um, but the, the palace is, I think, the last stop on a must-do one-day visit in Istanbul. Uh, it reigned during 600 years of the Ottoman Empire. There were some 30 sultans who were here um, beginning in the 15th century uh, with the Emperor Mehmed, who conquered Mehmed II, who conquered Constantinople and built this palace. And as successive sultans occupied it, uh, as they do, they renovated, expanded, changed it according to their tastes. And as a result, it now reflects Islamic and Ottoman and European architecture um, and styles. It could have housed during its era as a palace 1,000 to 4,000 inhabitants. Um, and the spaces that are included are spaces for administrative and ceremonial and entertaining functions. It has lavish gardens um, to this day very well maintained, library residences um, for the family and the harem. And now it is uh, open to the public as a museum. So it is, that's one of the reasons why it's a must do stop on your visit to Istanbul. Um, it's dedicated to the imperial collections of the Ottoman Emperor. 
uh, and uh, this designation as a museum took place in 1924, of course, when the Republic of Turkey was established by Ataturk. So uh, you can see on the left, the kind of the huge footprint that the palace takes. And on the right, you can see one of the many um, ornate salons that you will visit as you're, as you're going through. Well, from, from Istanbul, we board our cruise ship called the Island Sky. So I would be remiss if I didn't show you what the ship looks like. Um, and we head for Troy. And before we do that, I just want to stop Matt and see if there was any anything you wanted to say before we head out of Istanbul. Well, I'm excited to head down the coast. <laughs> um, uh, but but just one one last thought. While we're sort of have Istanbul in our in our minds, we're thinking about empires and we're thinking about palaces. You know, the other other way that that Asia Minor sort of is a, is a place of encounter in the ancient world. Another way of understanding what Paul's up to in this in this space is to think about um, is, is to think about empire. Um, this is a place where, um, as you as you just recounted your quick history, there have been many empires, many rulers that have come through, and the people who are who are living in this in this place have gotten pretty good at trying to imagine. Uh, trying to figure out how to how to sort of work with a foreign ruler and, and sort of make life continue to work and make sense of what these foreign rulers are all about. Um, and among among other things in, in Asia Minor, we have the invention during the Roman period of of the the cult of Roma, sort of deification of the city of Rome itself. That was not Rome trying to broadcast itself in this way. It was actually sort of folks in the in the Greek East, especially in Asia Minor, sort of trying to make sense of this sort of power reflect it back in a way that they thought would maybe uh, curry favor and also sort of help make sense of this sort of overwhelming power. Um, Prome in Greek, um, the, the name of Rome sort of sounds like Prome, the, 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 the word for strength, for power. Um, and it's, Rome seemed very much like that. Um, but again, Paul's making a really interesting intervention here. So you have the Basilius, the, the kingdom of, of Caesar, um, and here comes Paul sort of trying to proclaim a, a Belsilius, a kingdom of God. Um, and so uh, just uh, Paul sort of, in many ways, as he does throughout his letters, he's sort of um, taking up the language that is at hand. Um, another thing that he did that we, we get from, from roughly this, this period uh, or, or this, um, this area is uh, the Greek tradition of the democratic city-state or the language of the ecclesia which is a word that Paul takes up to, to describe church. Um, that's where we get, we, we translate that word happily as church, but people would have known what that meant before Paul started using it that way. It's the democratic group of people and the, the citizens of a city who make, make decisions about what seems right and good to do. Um, anyway, so, so as we're seeing sort of all, all this sort of, these various layers of, of politics, um, it's not, uh, even if it's historically like at a different period than Paul, um, I think it's setting a, an important context for understanding what Paul's up to. I, I love that you make that point because I and I advanced back just to kind of show somebody mentioned in the chat that the palace was a sprawling complex and um, you know just to show if you put this together with you know the Hagia Sophia the Blue Mosque and you think about that empire as um, the formation of nation state during that era it's impossible to separate the identity of the emperor from the identity of deity during that time. And it's, it's very difficult for us, especially as Americans living in a place that theoretically has a separation between church and state to wrap our minds around this concept of um, emperor or head of state as also deity. And you know, I think these, when you think about these buildings being built and the significance and the contested nature of religious iconography and imagery in the buildings, it's very much about establishing the power and authority of, you know, the deification of the leader. So when, as you say, when Paul comes in arguing for quite a different structure, social structure, it's extraordinarily revolutionary. And it's part of what gets him in trouble. I mean, it's, it's, it's in many ways the, sort of the, the very heart of what gets him in trouble. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a big reason why Christians were being martyred for, uh, for centuries, right? Is they were challenging the, the deification of the emperor by saying there's another, you know, there's another social order. So um, I really appreciate that you put it in that context, because I think it will help us understand why 
why we connect these sites, you know, the many different ways that we connect these sites to uh, biblical study, to historical study, and to, to understanding um, some of the texts and, and things that we know about um, and things that we're going to learn about on the trip. So our, our first stop as we make our way down the coast is Troy. Uh, of course, this is a city with 4,000 years of history, but we know it um, most widely as the site of Homer's epic poem, the Iliad was mentioned in the Iliad, um, the site of the Trojan War, it's surrounded by myth, of course, but as a result of archeological ex excavations, um, it's widely accepted as the place made known by the Iliad, uh, the site of the Trojan War, and it's designated by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. Um, this, of course, was a staple myth in classical Greek and Roman literature, and uh, Something that Homer says is that the walls were so strong built that they withstood this 10 year siege that was the Trojan War and the only way to take them to take out Troy was this clever ruse of the Trojan force uh, because the fortress itself was impenetrable. Uh, and I think that story really captures a significant aspect of Troy's importance in antiquity, because if you think back to the map that we looked at in the beginning of the presentation, we noted that Istanbul has this very strategic position on two continents and Troy is the very next place you make your way to um, as you come down the coast. And so it, it, it was actually closer to the sea in um, times of antiquity. It had this very strategic position between Aegean and Eastern civilizations was one of the main points of access to the Black Sea. Um, and if you think about back then, people were working with the winds as they were sailing their ships. You know, they didn't have engines, so the influence of the wind on their route was very important. And that made Troy a really important tactical position for ancient sailing vessels. Um, and most, one of the most important in the North Aegean, in fact. So archaeologists are still excavating this region. They're still exploring the layered ruins there. Um, on our trip, we stop at the museum to learn a little bit more about the interplay between what's myth and what's true um, in the history of Troy. So our next stop is uh, we go to Pergamon, and this is one of Turkey's finest archaeological sites. Um, it was founded in the third century BC, uh, protector of the Hellenistic cities, and it reached its height during this period as a capital of the Atalid dynasty, uh, which ruled from the second and the third century BCE following the death of, um, of Alexander the Great. So sort of ruling post of great kings. There was a library here that was assembled, um, and in order to do so, they had to learn to mass produce uh, parchment which was made from the this, this skins of sheep and calves. And uh, if we think about the, inner, the trade and the interplay between different, the different great cities and kingdoms at that time, we have the Ptolemies in Egypt, um, who of course were keepers of this vast library in Alexandria. And uh, Ptolemy IV didn't wanna export any papyri from Egypt because he didn't want anybody else to have a good library like they had in Alexandria. So if I hoard the paper, nobody else can make a library. Um, and so Pergamon achieved that library through the production of parchment. And parchment then became popular for its strength and its durability. Um, so I'll stop there because I see Matt very, very eager. And of course, parchment scrolls um, being some of the things that we use to recover some of these uh, ancient biblical texts. So I'll pass to you, Matt. I know this is an area you want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, one of the exciting moments at, at, at Yale when you know when I teach is to bring students down to the Beinecke and and get them in the same room with a with a New Testament papyrus and give them a sense of the sort of fragile materiality. You sort of think of a, a Bible as something you can buy any you know buy anywhere, um, and uh, but, but these texts um, come through to us through these really fragile sorts of. Um, uh, careful processes. Um, I, I think per Pergamon is one of I think the, the, the best places um, to sort of see the sort of 
vibrant re religious marketplace, to see these various temples, to see a temple um, sort of dedicated to Trajan and sort of think about the overlaps of, of empire and, and, and religious um, reflection. Um, and, to, and, and for and the, the Asclepion, the, um, the sort of traditions of Asclepius and sort of the healing, um, of course, early, early Christians were, were known as people who practiced uh, healing of, of, uh, in various ways. And again, so sort of the, they weren't the first folks to sort of poke uh, religious practice and, um, and healing, what we might think of as medicine sort of together. Um, there were stories of, of miraculous healings um, happening in the, in the cult of Asclepius um, uh, uh, all, all over the ancient world, or at least it, it would have been known to folks. And, um, uh, and again, I think here we can really sort of, uh, sort of see all of this side by side and sort of, uh, again, sort of see that um, the, the claims and the sort of way of life that Paul's proposing sort of in its, in its ancient context as he's sort of inviting people into a particular way of life, um, making sense of, of, of empire and of power in a particular way, the power of the, of the crucified one rather than the power of the conqueror, right? That somehow the crucified one is, is, is a conqueror, uh, is stronger, is mightier, as he says in 1 Corinthians, right? The sort of wisdom of God wiser, um, the foolishness of God wiser than the wisdom of men, the, the, the foolishness of God um, why, uh, wiser than the wisdom of men, the, the weakness of God stronger than the, the, the strength of men. Um, and sort of get a sort of physical sense of like what, uh, uh, of, of what kind of claims about what power is, what strength is, what wisdom is, um, that Paul's sort of making these claims um, sort of against the backdrop of what sort of marketplace he is participating in. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that detail. Um, and I wanted to highlight that we do visit the um, Sleep Beyond Healing Center there. So um, just, you know, this site really capturing some of the core elements of what captures people's imagination in the ancient world. Healing, um, knowledge, learning, and, uh, and, and this becomes a big um, element for the disciples of Christ, right? As they sort of disperse out and spread new ways of knowing and ways of accumulating knowledge. Um, so excited for you all to get to stop here. And moving on, we go to an equally exciting uh, stop, which is Ephesus. Um, and I, I love talking about this stop because it, hits on exactly what you were saying earlier, Matt, just as far as how many different aspects of worship and religious identity existed side by side. Um, so Ephesus is best known possibly for the Temple of Artemis that was built and rebuilt uh, and rebuilt from the 6th century um, BC to up to the 5th century in the, in the common era. And it was dedicated to the goddess Artemis, of course, who was goddess of the hunt, of chastity, of childbirth, wild animals, and the wilderness. Uh, it stood at twice the size of the Parthenon in Athens, and um, its dimensions were so grand that it was once one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And yet today, very little of the temple remains. Um, some of its pieces and artifacts can be found at the British Museum, uh, but it was ultimately uh, destroyed by by Christians in the common era and that sort of brought an end to its contested life. Um, Ephesus throughout its history was a, a port city, an intellectual center. Um, today, it's one of the more complete sites in the uh, ancient sites in the region. There have been 150 years of excavation here um, and had led us to find the, some of the broad streets, the buildings that are quite impressive, the mosaics, the temples, uh, possibly the largest theater in the ancient world, which we see pictured here at the bottom, built into the side of Mount Pion, hangs at 100 feet above the city, had space for 25,000 people. Um, and you can imagine, you know, the Apostle Paul here sort of preaching the gospel to Ephesians amidst a culture where yet the goddess Artemis is still very widely worshipped. Um, so I'll stop there, Matt. I see Matt nodding quite a bit. Pass to you. 
Yeah, yeah. So Ephesus, um, we, if, if you know the New Testament at all, may know that um, uh, one of the uh, books of the New Testament is, uh, is, a, is a letter purported to be written by Paul, purportedly to a church in Ephesus. Um, that actually may not be our, 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 our best hook for, for Ephesus on this, on this trip. Um, the, we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about whether Ephesians was uh, addressed originally to, to Ephesus. Um, the, 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 there are two important, and, and I suppose maybe for, even for background, I should just say, you know, as New Testament scholars, we're sort of inclined to see there's sort of three, at least three different ways that we could know about someone named Paul, right, from the New Testament. Think about the letters that Paul wrote, we could think about letters that maybe Paul wrote or maybe someone wrote in Paul's name. And we could think about Paul, the character of Luke's um, book, The Acts of the Apostles. Um, and that um, and, and, and that's really, I think, one of our best hooks here for Ephesus. In Acts 19, we have this vivid encounter or vivid account of Paul sort of ending up sort of in, getting himself in trouble. The, the, the thought is, or the story goes that, that Paul is... Um, is, is finding so many converts in Ephesus, um, and those converts are deciding that they don't need to have shrines um, to Artemis anymore in their homes, um, and so they stop buying sort of the silver statues um, that that so many of their uh, of their fellow citizens were buying, and this gets Paul in trouble with a local silver merchant who try who wants to who gets the silver merchants together to try to run run Paul out of town. Um, so again, so we talk about this like, vibrant, vibrant religious marketplace. Um, that's not always, it's always the safest place to be if you're trying to um, sort of peddle a, a, a particular um, a religious picture or spiritual understanding of the world. Um, it may be that incident that Paul is reflecting on actually in 1 Corinthians, um, among surely the most important of, of Paul's um, letters that, 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 that we have in the New Testament. Um, where Paul somewhat cryptically says in, in chapter 15 at some point, it's like, look, why, you know, if, if uh, he's making a theological argument, as he usually is, about whether whether there's a resurrection, it's like, look, if there's no resurrection, why, basically, why am I putting myself in, 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 in mortal danger day after day? And he just sort of throws in there, um, if, if with merely human hopes, I fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it? Um, probably those, those, I mean, we could maybe start to imagine that Paul's literally thrown to the beasts at some point in, in Ephesus. Or, the, or, a, or a gladiating scenario. Right, yeah, he's, he's some, that's probably unlikely. Um, Paul's a Roman citizen, surely couldn't legally have been put in that sort of situ, situation. Um, and, and, and surely it seems like Luke would have, would have um, included this um, in his account in Acts 19, if, if the conflict with silversmiths came to this. Um, but at the very least, surely Paul is reflecting, as it seems reasonable from Acts 19, that the that the conflict in Ephesus was, uh, I think, is a metaphor. Um, but it, but it, it was it was substantial enough that he may have uh, he may have, he may have legitimately felt that his his life was in danger. Um, anyway, so all to say, we we have these particular sort of points. And for me, even as a as a reader of of Paul's letters, I think some one of the things that's exciting to me about this trip is this this trip is inviting us always to. You put those Pauls back together. If um, if 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 you've been if anyone has inflicted biblical scholarship of the sort that um, <laughs> that, I, that I learned for many years in graduate school, and you've learned to parse these things together uh, apart, um, these places are inviting us to sort of put them together. Um, what was you know, Paul says he's staying in Ephesus for some time. Actually, at the end of First Corinthians, it seems to be a really important community for him, a place where he would where he would stay, where he had he had friendly people who would who would host him. Um, and, and, oh, what do you know? I mean, that does go together with the story, just the story that Luke is telling. Um, and, and Ephesus is one of these places where the, where the, the, the letters are sort of firsthand. We don't have any, we don't have a single word that Jesus wrote, right? Um, the only accounts we have in the, of the, by, in the Bible of Jesus writing anything was in sand, um, in, in John chapter eight. Um, but we have letters that, that Paul actually wrote. And when you, but here in Ephesus, there's a place where the, the letters themselves and, and the, some of the stories that are written late, much later by, uh, by Luke, the historian, um, seem, to, seem, seem to come together um, in ways that start to paint this really vivid, this really vivid picture. I think it's, it's quite exciting when you think about the diversity of the marketplace, not just of things like these silver Artemis statues, but the marketplace of the ideas that go behind the things, right? Marketplace of ideas, people coming together from different parts 
uh, near and far. And I, I want to say hi to Tim Jackson because he kind of points that out. Tim Jackson is one of our Yale alum. And I know you're going on this trip, Tim. We were in Egypt together. And he is a, a, he's a biblical scholar, theologian himself. Um, and says Ephesus was also the birthplace of the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus. So, um, you know, that kind of gives more weight to this idea of it being a center of ideas. And I want to say hi also to Carla, who says that it was fascinating to see the apartments of the 1% recently excavated. Uh, the library has a carving of menorah, if my memory is correct. So there were Jews there as well as pagans who became Christian. Uh, and it's, it's a very good point you're making, Carla, because um, there were there are other sites of significance in Ephesus. So uh, the, the House of the Virgin Mary is there, and this is considered to be the last home that she had before she ascended. So um, you will find that actually Christian and Muslim pilgrims uh, visit this place to um, pay homage to the Virgin Mary and to drink from the nearby springs that are thought to have healing waters. Uh, and Carla is referencing the Roman terraced houses that have been excavated at Ephesus. And they show us, as she says, how the 1% lived during that time with their slaves. There are well-preserved mosaics and artifacts um, that come out of these um, recent excavations. So quite a lot. And as you say as well, Carla, you know, there's a, there was a, a lot of diversity in the ancient Christian world. So it wasn't just, we think of it now as the ancient Christian world, but that's not what it was at the time. It was the ancient diverse world. Um, and, you know, I think perhaps in your travels, some of you have been to Turkey in your travels today, you still find quite a bit of diversity in the ideology around the country as you travel. So I wanna take us forward to our next stop, which is Didyma. And this word means twins in Greek. This is the place where uh, Zeus's twins, Apollo and Artemis were conceived. Uh, the temple of Apollo lies here. It's an essential fixture in Turkey's ancient history because the Oracle of Apollo resided within its interior. This was a spring that flowed until the temple was sacked by the Persians in 494 BC. And it was said that this, that the spring disappeared because the Persians uh, took away the bronze statue of the god Apollo. Uh, when Alexander the Great came through in 334 BC, he defeated the Persians and the temple subsequently underwent restoration. Uh, the court historian of Alexander the Great tells the legend that the oracle waters, the oracle of Apollo began to flow once again as Alexander passed through Egypt in 331 BC. And of course, this was, we know, many of us know the uh, Oracle at Delphi in Greece. And this one was a peer in terms of its significance and importance in the ancient world. Um, the huge white, wa uh, white walled temple was uh, marble and it was buttressed by 120 giant columns. So we can see the ruins of some of them here at the front, and then in the back, the temple priest would meet uh, petitioners who would come to ask questions of the oracle, and the temple priest would deliver oracular poems. So again, just thinking about you know uh, the times in which um, Paul comes forward, this is the heritage that precedes him, and really gives us a, a sense of how well entrenched this heritage was. Um, how significant it was to the power structure as well as to the lives of everyday people. Uh, so I'll pass to you, Matt. I know this is another place you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I believe this is also the stop when we will um, go through Miletus. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. And, and so Miletus, again, sort of picking up in Acts, um, Miletus is a, is a place where later in Paul's life, um, uh, Paul is uh is is passing through i believe he's already he's already uh, uh he's on his way to rome at that point he's been sort of taken he's he's uh, appealed his case uh to, to to caesar and as they're as the ship is passing through he's he's sort of um his movement is restricted here uh, in any case he, he invites the the 
the leaders of the church at Ephesus, he sends word from Miletus. Uh, I think we're to guess that it's somewhere down at the coast there um, that that he invites the the leaders to come meet with him. And we get this long Luke is one of the longest speeches and acts of of Luke, just sort of um, telling telling these longtime friends uh, of his sort of how they ought to go on and lead these communities after he is gone. He has every sense that he will not see them again. Um, and, and Luke even sort of notes um, that they were, they were weeping um, because of what he said, especially because he said that I know that I will not see you again. Um, but this is, uh, uh, anyway, when I, when I think of some of the more sort of personal sort of intimate sort of moments in Luke's narration, of um of the ministry of paul uh, that meeting between paul and the leaders of the church um, from ephesus in or, or near miletus um i think is just one of the most sort of um, intimate moments you can sort of imagine what 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 that is like to uh to see to see friends with whom you have lived life over, over the span of many many years um and, and even as we think about how we relate to, to young people that we that we care for sort of trying to intentionally give words of wisdom, what would you say as he sort of um, gives sort of parting, parting words to a community that you've led, to a community that you've lived life in? Um, well, I, I will certainly have those words um, uh, with me uh, when we are uh, in that place. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I love the way that these kind of examples that you're giving bring to life um, a, a world that we can't connect with and yet you know, the way that you tell us the stories, we can, because a lot of times when you're visiting ruins and you're visiting these ancient sites, you don't get a sense of the vibrancy of the culture and the communities that were there. Um, and that's one of the wonderful aspects of traveling with a scholar like you, is that you've helped to bring, to bring this to life. Um, I'm going to advance the slides, but I want to address a couple of the questions that have come up in the, uh, in the chat. Um, someone asked earlier if there was a concern um, with Russia's aggression around Ukraine's Black Sea ports, um, such as Odessa, impacting this trip. So we're in Istanbul. I just want to make it clear, first of all, that the trip, you land in Istanbul and you board the ship there, but you're pretty much in Istanbul for a day and a half. Um, unless you're joining the pre-trip extension, which um, gives you several more days to explore Istanbul. Uh, right now, we do not have concerns about traveling to Turkey. We work with uh, several tour companies. So one here in the US, as well as uh, another tour company on the ground in Turkey. And so we have very close connections with um, security information and um, circumstances on the ground that allow us to, at this point, feel very comfortable operating the trip, um, but we do monitor, uh, we monitor the circumstances as we go forward. Right now, we're not seeing any concern for um, not running the trip, so we do think, yes, that it's fine traveling along the Kirk Turkish coast on a, on a um, leisure uh, cruise ship. There are no issues with that. Uh, there was another question, is there any required clothing or attire to visit the religious sites? So when you are visiting um, the mosques, in general, any mosque that you visit, you do want to um, adhere to local custom, which is um, for women to cover their heads uh, and to wear um, clothing that basically goes below the knee um, and long sleeves. But generally, people provide that. You know, you're able to sort of pick that up if you need to when you're entering these facilities. But I would just say, you know, if you're mindful of that, anytime you're um, in a Muslim space, there's an expectation that women would cover their heads and that men and women both would um, would wear uh, more conservative, what we would consider as Americans more conservative attire. And let me see if there was anything else in the questions. I think I've hit them all, but if you have any other sort of technical questions about the trip, please do feel free to ask. And uh, we'll keep going with our next stop, which is Xanthos, uh, built on a great cliff overlooking 
uh, a river designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is an archaeological complex that's considered um, the most ex unique example of the ancient Lycian civilization, um, a pinnacle culture of Iron Age Anatolia. And uh, there are two sites here, Xanthos and Latun, which taken together uh, the UNESCO designation is because they illustrate a very unique combination of Antalian, Greek, Roman, and Byzantine civilizations that uh, were found here. Um, one of the other unique things about this site is some of the most important texts from the Lycian language were uh, found in inscriptions engraved on stone pillars here. And these inscriptions are uh, really crucial for better understanding the history of the Lycian people and their Indo-European language, um, which is, you know, doesn't really have a connection with the Hellenic culture that um, subsequently followed them. Lycians were an ancient group that inhabited this area presently known as Turkey between the bays of Antalya and Ptia. And they were admired by the ancient Greeks. Um, Matt, you spoke about sort of the democratic pra practices of the Greeks and the ecclesiastic sort of um, bent that St. Paul brings up. And this is an ancient group that sort of similarly had a very unique democratic uh, federation during that time. It's considered one of the first democratic unions known in global history. And it came about at a time when Greek city-states were sort of constantly at war with each other. Um, the Lyce Lycian cities uh, enjoyed a peace amongst themselves. They had their own language, as I said, their language had a unique alphabet. Um, later, they adopted Greek around third century BC, uh, but the Greek historian Herodotus notes that their customs were different from Hellenic customs. Um, and for example, they retained some of the ancient ma matriarchal customs that were um, commonly a part of the region uh, predating the Hellenic era. Their uh, national assembly was held each year at a shrine of Lycia in the neighboring uh, city of Latun, and it was presided by a female. So not something we often hear about in the ancient world, but there is this tradition of matriarchal um, culture if we go back and look for it. Uh, there's a blending of traditions here between the Lycian tradition and the Hellenistic, um, especially with the funerary art. So when you're here, you want to look for um, the tombs cut out of rocks, the pillar tombs, the sarcophagi in Xanthos. They're, they're very unique examples of ancient funerary architecture. And I think, I didn't know, Matt, if you wanted to say something about Tara. We can keep pressing for it, yeah. Okay, so um, we do we do stop in Tara, and um, it's known, well, tourists know it for the beaches. Um, Christian scholars might think of it as the birthplace of St. Nicholas. Um, it's also a place where St. Paul stopped in, in uh, 60 BCE, or and uh, in the common area, so, Sarah, sorry, not BCE, CE. Um, and one of the stops along his missionary travels. Uh, I'm just pointing out here just a little bit more information about it. So we hear uh, St. Paul talk about uh, Katara in Acts 21, saying that this was a route that he was traveling along on his third missionary journey, just showing a little bit more of what it looks like. And then we move on to uh, Antalya and the um, ancient ruins of Perga. And this is a settlement that dates back to the Bronze Age. And uh, Alexander the Great rode through the gates here. Um, and likewise, the Apostle Paul was here preaching on his missionary journey. So now there's a, a wonderful museum which we will visit and it boasts some of the most beautiful um, Hellenistic and Roman ruins in Turkey. On the right, you see the um, very well-preserved theater. There's a Roman stadium, baths, 
Um, there are long rows of beautiful colonnaded and cobbled streets. And this is um, very recently designated as the start of the St. Paul Trail. So I know some of you had mentioned um, hiking and looking at trails. There's a, a trail that is connected to the ancient Lycia civilization, but there's also a new St. Paul Trail. And it follows the Apostles' route uh, to Antioch, follows portions of the original Roman road, and it travels along um, as well along the coast of Lake Erder, which is not well known, not a well known place in Turkey, but um, considered to be quite a beautiful uh, place to go and see. So for those of you who are thinking about walking, you might look into the St. Paul Trail. And I'll just check in with you again, Matt, to see if there was more you wanted to say about that region. Uh, I'm 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 excited to get to Tarsus. So <laughs> <laughs> ah, when are we getting to Tarsus? <laughs> Let's do that. Let's keep going. Here we are. <laughs> uh, so our final stop on our cruise is Tarsus, and uh, I I won't say anything. I'll I'll stop and um, <laughs> and let and let you talk about Tarsus. <laughs> Is this my is this my punishment, Lauren, for for pushing? No, for, no. For I wanted to. I wanted to. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm a fan of St. Paul, but I'm also a fan of the um, of the history of the region. So I, I want to talk about Cleopatra, but oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna let St. Paul go first. All right, good, good. Yeah, you make sure to tell us about Mark Antony and, and Cleopatra. That would be. That, that, I'll leave that for you. Um, yeah, no. So, so uh, Tarsus, you may know. Uh, Paul is is known as Paul of Tarsus. Uh, this is his uh, birthplace, the place where. Um, he is he is shaped. Um, there have been many. Um, again, I, as uh, as some have even mentioned in the chat, not to uh, keep going back to the same uh, the same well over and over again. But again, religious, ethnic, cultural diversity, um, uh, intellectual diversity um, in Asia Minor. Again, Tarsus is a place where we see a lot of overlap of different uh, religious cults uh, cults by the way with is a word that we use in in, in describing the ancient world uh, without without prejudice um, cult just meaning uh, uh, sort of temple practice that's all um, and so uh, in fact there's been a lot of, of work um, done over the years sort of speculating about um, ways that different kinds of religious expressions so-called pagan um, uh, now um, pagan is a a, a word that uh, means uh, rustic or country. It's a uh, uh, anyway. Uh, in the ancient world, it would have been some sort of backhanded uh, slur or something like that. But anyway, uh, it, uh, which sorts of um, religious practices were were helping uh, Paul perhaps think about his own um, religious life? So Paul, raised as as uh, as a Jew, um, raised of course not in Palestine, not in Judea, but um, but but in um, in Tarsus, um, in Asia Minor. Um, that sort of um, that that identity from not uh, not from Judea but from the Judean from the Jewish diaspora in the ancient world, um, what did it mean for Paul to put together his own Jewish identity, his own religious identity, um, from the sort of margins of a diaspora, always already in some sort of conversation with um, religious practices that were not his own, um, including importantly um, some that. Uh, had a really important central myths about um, uh, God's dying and being raised again. Um, is this sort of helped Paul sort of with his imagination when um, this sort of Christian message about about Jesus uh, comes to him? Um, so yes, uh, Tarsus uh, crucially important uh, for understanding um, who Paul is. Um, we don't have any sort of at least not in the in, in this in the Bible, we don't have any sort of accounts of the the childhood of Paul. We're left to sort of imagine. But one of the ways that we can imagine is to sort of to go to Tarsus and to um, to, to try to understand the history of of the place when he was there. What kind of education would Paul have received? It seems Luke at least is convinced that Paul had a sort of rabbinic education, perhaps one that he got in Palestine. But what kind of education did he have before before that? Would he have had um, uh, a rhetorical education. We've had even the beginnings of some sort of philosophical education. Um, we don't know, but one of the ways that um, that uh, scholars uh, try to fill in those gaps is just trying to understand what is the lay of what is sort of the lay of the land. Um, you sort of go from trying to do 
when, when biography fails, you try to go do some sociology, right? Um, we don't know specifically about Paul, but what would, it, what would life have been like, right, for a young person raised in that place with that cultural identity, that religious identity, um, uh, and, and, and what kind of education would have been available to him? I, I want to, just as we imagine what Paul's childhood might have been like in Tarsus, I wanted to point out the um, image on the left is St. Paul's well. Um, and it's not known whether it's historically actually St. Paul's well, but it is said that he uh, often drank from these waters and therefore now considered to have curative powers. So it is a site that pilgrims on the Paul St. Paul Trail will visit when they're coming into Tarsus. Um, and other sites that we might visit are the, well, we will visit are the um, very rich with artifacts Tarsus Museum, which has uh, a collections of archeological and ethnographic artifacts. And that of course will help round out that picture as well as what was, what was this place like when St. Paul was living there. So opportunity to spend some time at the Tarsus Museum. And then our, the last stop on the tour is a visit to the Grand Mosque, which you see on the right. And again, just sort of continuing the theme of, you know, this, um, these, all of these sites that we're visiting in Turkey have very diverse um, histories coming from, you know, Hellenistic periods, um, Byzantine, and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned someone asked me about Alexander the Great, you know, sort of Persian occupation of Turkey and Alexander the Great coming in and, and um, conquering. So you, know, you have all these different groups who have lived in the region and left their footprint on it. Um, I was joking that I wanted to talk about Cleopatra. So uh, I recently finished a, someone asked me for a reading list. So we will share a reading list. One of the books that I would recommend, which is not directly related, but I think really interesting to read um, is called Cleopatra, A Life by Stacey Schiff. And it's a Pulitzer Prize winning book. It's very much a biography of Cleopatra, but it paints a really fascinating portrait of Ptolemaic Egypt. Um, during the reign of Cleopatra and helps you understand, uh, again, that connection that rulers made between themselves and deities and the relationships between the different rulers of the region. Um, so, you know, the, the kings that we read about in the Bible, um, some of them were still around in Cleopatra's reign. Right, and what would the political dimension of connections between kings have been? So that's something that I just found really fascinating by um, reading uh, Cleopatra, A Life by Stacey Schiff. And uh, she talks about the theatrical ways and the flamboyant way in which sort of Cleopatra endeared herself to the Roman Empire. Um, one of which was her, uh, her penchant for putting on phenomenal parties and for arraying herself um, as uh, a, a goddess in many different forms. And so one of the stops on the visit to Tarsus is Cleopatra's gate. And it's said that she passed through the gate disguised as Aphrodite when she was on a sailing trip uh, to meet Mark Anthony or Mark Antony in 41 BCE. And this would be something that she would do quite frequently, sailing around the Mediterranean from Egypt um, on campaigns to make connections and political relationships with local rulers. Um, and in fact, it's also said that this whole peninsula that we're sailing along um, was gifted by Mark Antony to Cleopatra in their day. Uh, and of course, coming right on the heels of uh, Cleopatra's demise, we reach the moment of the birth of Christ and the beginning of, you know, a new era. So not directly in the same moment, but it really tells you, studying that history really tells you a lot about what was going on in the world that Christ was born into. Um, so really fascinating things to think about as we finish our tour. Uh, we, and we finish in perhaps one of the most, uh, I think, one of the most interesting places in the region which is the island of um, St. Paul, or uh, island of Cyprus. This is where St. Paul undertook his first missionary journey. 
And what's what's so interesting about Cyprus is its geographic position in the Middle East. Um, it has a political affiliation with Europe. It's if you look at it on a map, it sits amidst Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, and Greece. And for this reason, it's changed hands numerous times throughout its millennia. It belonged to the uh, Mycenaean Greeks, the Assyrians, the ancient Egyptians, the Persians, the Phoenicians. Um, it had alliances with Athens and Alexander the Great. It was a province of Rome. It was controlled by the Byzantine Empire. Venice colonized it in the 15th century, followed by the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, and Great Britain in the 20th century. Uh, so it just arrives in our times um, as the independent Republic of Cyprus and the Republic of Northern Cyprus, with the Republic of Northern Cyprus uh, not only being recognized by the country of Turkey. Um, but I think it's fitting into our talk about this trip uh, to say that it's perhaps known, Cyprus is perhaps known in the classical imagination of the birthplace of Aphrodite. And here she emerged from the sea, from a sea of foam on the coastal waters. Uh, and if we think about just the beauty and the complexity of the history and, and uh, the places that we're exploring here, I think it's very fitting to end on the island of Aphrodite uh, in the storied Mediterranean region. So I'll stop here and uh, toss to you, Matt, in case you have any closing comments. And then um, we have a little bit of time to take any any questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, just just to say that you know the sort of reason this um, that Cyprus sort of becomes the ends up, um, or one of the reasons that it, that it is the sort of first visit on the first missionary journey for Paul is because of the importance. Um, of the of the city of Antioch um, to Paul's Paul's mission. So, we go if we were to go further east, um, we'd get to Antioch in what is now Syria, and um, that's really the uh, much of the sort of uh, much of Paul's sort of struggles in his in his professional life <laughs> came down to, a, to trying to work his relationship with the church in Jerusalem. Um, but the church in Antioch was was sort of his home turf. That was his um, that was the sort of uh, home uh, home of the multi ethnic church, um, which is really sort of what what Paul is interested in. What does it mean to uh, in the ancient world um, many sort of religion and others? Well, this is this is contested, but some have sort of proposed that one way of thinking about how new what Paul was doing was to think that for many in the ancient world. Um, what kind of religion you practiced and what, where you were from were kind of the same thing. Um, and here's Paul sort of proclaiming uh, a different kind of uh, understanding of the world where um, people from different places with different sort of cultural and ethnic backgrounds might worship together. Um, and that was, uh, that was a, a vision sort of that, that first sort of came together in Antioch. Um, and it was really that community that that was um, that was helping Paul, um, a sort of home base for Paul. Um, again, uh, when, we, when we get to Cyprus, I'll I'll find find the beach, and I guess uh, we'll be in the south. Look, I'll look, look, look to the left, <laughs> and imagine the Antioch over over the horizon. Um, uh, so that was uh, that that was really and and think about that sort of vision, and and that sort of I think is a vision for sort of religiosity, a sort of way of understanding the world um, that made sense of these sort of the the distinctness of different peoples, but also what it might mean to 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 share something together in our shared humanity and our shared sense of perhaps uh, of, of of the world and, and life and what it might all be about. So yeah, excited to, to be on this trip. Oh, Lauren, I think you're muted. I was muted. There we go. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. We are um, we are right up against the end of our time, and uh, I think Carla for sharing with everyone. Uh, make sure that if you can, you stand and see Cappadocia. I yeah, I do think Cappadocia is is quite beautiful underground cities there and mummies too. So thank you for those suggestions, Carla.
Um, I want to thank Matt for joining us as well and for all of your wonderful input and also for um, being willing to uh, bring your knowledge and expertise and uh, your enthusiasm for learning on this trip. I think it will be quite a learning experience for everyone who's on board. Uh, so I, we're right at our time. So I'm going to log off, but we will see you all on the next one. And we'll be sending you a reprise of all the festival recordings so that if you missed any of the presentations, you can go back and watch them um, at your leisure. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.